Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we need to get oxygen set up, and I believe we're also going to try to knock out some hatch ranching. The issue with getting an oxygen set up going is sustainable sources of water. Right now, this is the only one that we know of. And while I don't necessarily mind having this heated water being flown through the base, it would become a little difficult to make sure it was temperature controlled enough to where it wasn't too hot to stifle the crops, or too cold to also stifle the crops. Because remember, once you have that oxygen set up going, you're pumping it into this base. Now, we do have our beautiful radiator system working, and it's going well. But I also don't want to counteract what the radiator is doing with what our oxygen supply is doing. So it would be ideal if our oxygen supply was also maintained at the same temperature. So for that reason, this episode, we're also going to be on the hunt for more geysers. Now, we've already found this natural gas geyser. I'm really looking forward to tapping into it. And then there's also this geyser here. I'm really crossing my fingers that it is a some sort of water geyser. But let's be honest, knowing our luck, it's probably going to be a major volcano or even better yet, a carbon dioxide geyser. Now, when you're looking back from this area, sometimes the neutronium is a little difficult to see. But there's one trick you can do, especially on Rhyme, to kind of highlight those geyser and vent locations. If we click on the temperature overlay, it shows the ambient temperature of everything around, and you can see that the neutronium kind of stands out a little bit easier. So for that reason, when we're digging around, we can keep our eyes open to see if we see any other vents or geysers. And right now we don't, so it's time to do some more digging. We're also going to be keeping our eyes open for more dupes. Right now we've got all the dupes we need to keep our crops going, but as some of the harvests come in, some of the tending needs to the plants, for instance, irrigating on the bristle blossoms, falls behind. So I think it is okay for us to increase up to dupe number six and possibly number seven. Someone suggested in the comments that our radiator system might actually not be working 100% correct, that it still might be a little too full. The entire time I was watching yesterday, I just assumed it was the lag. So we're just gonna try to take a small little amount out of this pipe and see if this water flows a little bit faster. Here comes Happy now. We're gonna wait for just one bucket. There goes the bucket. Now I'm gonna cancel it and see if we see any better flow. The flow is about the same, so I'm gonna have Happy take out one more bucket full of water. Here we go again. Oh yes, that's looking a lot better. Now we don't get this stutter step of water flow. And this is great because now our radiator will work even better. Next up on the research, we're actually going to try to get notification systems because we want the party line phone. You may remember from the last episode that we're eventually going to empty out this liquid reservoir and right now it has almost three tons of highly food poisoned water and I'd like to use that water. The problem is the only place where the dupes directly consume that water is in this water cooler. So if we research the party line phone, we can remove the water cooler and just put in the phone system. And that will decrease the chances of them getting food poisoning. Another shout out to the comments, and this is something I didn't even think about, is the fact that there's no slime lung right now in these biomes, as evidenced by the germ overlay, because it's actually too cold for slime lung. Slime lung only lives in a temperature range of 10 degrees to 100. Any hotter or any colder, no slime lung. Now we still have to be careful because remember, we're trying to heat our base up to around 20 something degrees, which means slime lung would be able to live inside of our base. But for most of the environment outside the base, we're not actually worried about getting slime lung. Now, one of the issues when we're starting to think about digging is the fact that we have a misaligned pod. You can see in the star map that we have an alternate pod location. So we don't know where this is in relation to everything else. So in order to figure that out, we need to start digging everywhere, all the way to the left, all the way to the right, and then top and bottom accordingly. Now, most of these places aren't gonna get us into trouble, but I do want to avoid dumping all this nice water and interfering with this polluted water. So to start with, I think we're just gonna dig over on the tops. And while we're over here, I think we should probably stop by for a quick look at this vent. And then I think the easiest way to dig down is just to open up a little gap here. So I think we'll put a mechanized airlock in here. Now the mechanized airlock, unfortunately, will spread temperature, unlike the insulated tiles. But it shouldn't be too bad, especially considering how close it is to our coal generator and the radiator pipes that are underneath this. All right, Dr. Banner has finished up the research so we can put in the beautiful party line phone. 
Now, unfortunately, it's the only one. So people are just going to practice talking to themselves on it. Now, on the subject of hatch ranching, we did find a lot more sedimentary rock around this colony. So I'm not too worried about it. So I think it's about time to get started on ranching. First things first, we're going to load up this container here with sedimentary rock. We'll do it at a priority of four. And then we'll do the same for these critter feeders. Once we have that set, then we'll throw in our eight critters and be on our way. But we already have nine critters in total, plus we have an egg, so already we need to build another ranch. All right, duplicating the hatches is done. Now let's see how fast they actually work. Yeah, it's been a half a cycle and they haven't even started. Now there's a couple problems. First, we have some other digging commands set up, but the second, just because we only have five dupes, and there's a lot of farming to tend to. So we are eagerly awaiting the arrival of the next dupe, which should be in 0.2 cycles. And here they are. Now I'm really hoping for Ashcan. He's a builder digger. He's got actually one of the new traits, starry eyed which means they get a morale bonus while sitting in space. Green thumb and unempathetic. Unempathetic is just a beautiful negative. Don't care how good you are at doctoring there, Ashcan. Then we have Trivaldo and Max. Max is a weird story. They have plus 12 to strength between supplying and tidying, but then they also have noodle arms. Not ideal. Then they have some garbage traits here. Art fundamentals and interior decorator. Max, you picked the wrong job in life, man. And then Travaldo, he's got the smattering of things, which might actually be useful. And again, not a bad negative trait and unempathetic. So over to power shall we go. Good luck, have fun. Dupe number three. Now that this is the third time that I've actually picked the dupe that we want and and power shell has given us the dupe we asked for i need to make sure everyone knows i am not gaming that system i'm only hitting that button once there are no fancy youtube games with cutting different shots to make sure that you saw the right number nope we got number three so fortunately we got to welcome ashcan home in this case we're gonna go with chris Pratt's character mr peter quill and i believe the name that he gave himself star lord it kind of fits he likes being in space and he's got a little green thumb. And that green thumb is in the form of Groot. Welcome to paradise, Star-Lord. Now, we already have a primary digger, but we don't have a primary builder. And the only difference now that you actually need to contend with is the fact that the building line actually has demolition. Now, eventually we'll have enough morale where we'll give them both digging and building. But for now, I think we're going to start off with the building line. So improved construction one it is, and there's your awesome hat. Star-Lord's priorities are the typical building and digging. We'll put them on the schedule with Happy. That seems like a good match. And we already have a cot and mess table ready for him. Well, we've discovered that our misaligned pod location is far to the left. Just a little bit of digging to the left side of our base, and we've already found the left side of the map. And despite being geoactive, we still haven't found any other vents or geysers. It's starting to make me think that the geoactive trait might be a little buggy. So here's a great tip for you. We completed the party line phone. It's not even plugged in and still counts as a recreation building for the Great Hall. This is exactly what I was talking about. All these bristle blossoms are waiting for irrigation. We're probably going to end up adding another dupe here in three cycles. Otherwise, we're never going to be able to get anything done. Here's another example. Our primary farmer can't keep up. This mealwood's been ready to harvest, as a lot of these are. In the meantime, we're actually going to use stable number two. That way we don't have to transport these hatches unnecessarily. And we're just going to throw a couple of hatches in here and feed them all that sedimentary rock to increase the chances that they actually lay a stone hatch egg. The other issue is we don't have a mechatronics engineer yet. Now we could throw somebody into mechatronics engineering, but we don't have anybody that loves doing it, which means it would be a morale disaster. I mention that because we're not gonna be able to automate the egg removal from here. So we're gonna have to get a little creative with that. We're probably gonna start with omelets or a drop off into the water for the evolution chamber. The other challenge is Black Panther right now is our only rancher. He's also the only one doing farming as a priority. And we saw how much he's actually fallen behind on the farming duties. So the ranching and tending to the critters is only gonna add to an already overloaded work schedule. But we gotta do what we gotta do. So what we're gonna do here is find a couple of young hatches. There's a 13 cycle old one here. We'll wrangle that one. And the second youngest hatch that we have is actually 
44 cycles old, so we'll start with two. So, good news and bad news. Good news, we found our sustainable source of water in the form of a cool slush geyser. The bad news is that polluted water is coming out at negative 10 degrees. At least we found some water. Alright, so I've changed my mind about the center bottom of the base being an exit. We're going to put some insulated tiles there. And what we're going to do is start setting up our main transport run. We know that the right side of the base is more centrally located because we're so close to the left side of the planetoid that we can plan for this to be our main transport run here as long as we don't hit in any sort of neutronium. Now there is two geysers here, but this one lands here and this one lands here. So we have about this far of a gap in order to build a transport network. Now, we're not thinking just ladders. We're thinking towards the future to when we're using transit tubes as well. Oh, we found the magma lamp. I really hope they have fixed it in this patch, that this is now a terrestrial artifact. Fingers crossed. All right, here's our next set of dupes. Now, I wouldn't mind getting any of these dupes. Rowan would be a cook for us. Liam would actually be that second rancher. And Joshua, well, I'm hoping we don't get Joshua. So I'm hoping for a one or a two on this. Specifically, I think we need the most help with ranching and farming right now, so I'm going to hope for one, but I'll take two either way. Back to PowerShell we go. We hit up to remember the next command, and then enter. We got dupe number two. Again, not my favorite, but it's always good to have a second cook, even though this one goes to the bathroom a lot and breathes an awful lot. Now, I had some difficulty naming this one, so I did the quick Google search on, like, what Marvel and DC comic heroes actually cook. And it was a few different recommendations. The most I've seen, though, was Gambit. The only other one that made sense was a character from the comics named Volstag. Apparently, he was an Asgardian who lost his memory and then became a well-known celebrity chef here on the beautiful blue rock we call Earth. But I don't know who Volstag is, so Gambit it is. Welcome to paradise, Gambit. Now, because we have two cooks, we're going to throw Gambit into cooking, but we're also going to tell him, hey... Make sure you do some farming as well. We already have Venom doing cooking and farming as well, so we'll set the same for Gambit. As for Gambit's skills, in order to use the grill, you have to get into grilling. So that's where his first skill point goes. And then we finish it off with a nice chef's hat. Oh, I am excited for a couple of reasons. First off, we have uranium on our home planetoid. That means we're going to get into some nuclear reactors. And it's going to be wonderful. The second thing I'm excited about is I've never seen a couple of these plants. I knew they were new, but I just hadn't seen them in any of our playthroughs. The first is the Tranquil Toes. That's body temperature likes to be from minus 90 to minus 0.1. And then the second one is the Saturn Critter Trap. It has the same temperature requirements, but what's crazy about them is they eat critters. They turn critters into hydrogen. You can even grow them with polluted water. And apparently when they harvest, they produce 12,000 calories of plant meat. I wonder if you can make barbecue out of plant meat. Finally, we found another cool steam vent. Not very exciting, but hey, at least it's another source of water. I'd like to keep digging over, but I don't want to mess with any of this uranium. I would like to see if we can get the bee network set up, because when they harvest the uranium, they use every last little bit. Whereas if we dig out this 105 kilos of uranium, it only becomes 52 kilos of uranium. As a matter of fact, there's a beta hive now. Oh, I so love the cute bee tinies. I think we're actually going to add dupe number eight. Now, I've got my eyes on Stinky. Starts with a plus seven agriculture. He's skilled in crop tending and he's it's only negative. He's biohazardous. Ada's not bad. A general tidy type of dupe. And then there's Marie. While Marie has suit wearing and tidying, She's also yokel and has a bottomless stomach. So in this case, I'm hoping for any dupe other than dupe number two. Back to PowerShell we go. Here we go. And it's dupe number two, because of course it is. I guess that's a little bit of the karma coming back to us. As for a name, well, we already picked one DC hero up, so we might as well pick another. And I don't know any other ladies who are strong and pull off wearing a suit better than Wonder Woman. We've thrown Wonder Woman and Gambit into shift number four, but since we're starting to dig outside the base quite a bit, I think it's about time to add that extra downtime. Now, I was starting to consider building this tank for this cool slush geyser, and I realized we're going to have an issue. Polluted water turns into a solid at minus 20. The surrounding area here is almost at minus 40, 
which means we're gonna have to put a tepidizer set up in here as well and that's another 960 watts i'm hoping we'll be able to tie that in with our oxygen system but we may have to pay the cost for that separately all right here's the basic design for our tank once we get all this dug out, we'll then uncap the cool slush geyser and put in the liquid tepidizer. I'm hoping we get it done while this thing is still active. I'd rather not wait another 45 cycles before getting water into this tank and then getting started on our oxygen center. Okay, this one is probably technically my fault. I should have kept the door. Apparently Star-Lord is starving. Thor doesn't care. Let me make sure we put a priority on this wall. I was gonna stop at eight dupes, but we're up to 282,000 calories, and, well, I'm a sucker for a meep. But instead of meep, because meep's a rancher that has critter aversion, which that's just bonkers, I'm really hoping to get Liam. Liam can do building and farming, has a green thumb, he's buff and gourmet, and the only thing they can't do is they're not a very good digger. So I'm hoping for number one on this, two and three, this is... A little risky. I should have passed on this, but I'd really like another dupe, and Liam is screaming at me for our farming needs. Now, if we get Joshua, we're throwing him into farming anyways, but if we get Meep, is still technically a rancher, even though he starts off with a minus two to husbandry. Back to power shall we go. Good luck. Dupe number two. Well, that's not ideal. The name I came up with for this dupe is Clark Kent. Clark grew up on a farm, so you'd figure he'd have a green thumb, because he's Superman, he's got that iron gut. Now, I can almost explain the digging because he can kind of use his laser eyes to bore out on rock, but I've got nothing on the cooking. Welcome to Paradise, Clark. We are finally ready for our beautiful thimble reed seed. We've actually found 10 of them. Hopefully, we'll be able to drink all the water with just one thimble reed. Oh, yeah. Our dupes, if you remember, only supply about an extra six or seven kilos per cycle. So even with 10 dupes, you're looking at 60 kilos extra of polluted water. And the thimble reed seed can drink 160 kilos per cycle. So we've completed our tank, and the cool slush geyser has gone off a couple of times, and Dr. Banner is in the middle of giving an analysis. Well, the polluted water is dropping and then kind of instantly turning into ice because, well, it's just too cold down here. Now, eventually, the polluted water will heat this place up, and I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek because we mean heat it up to minus 10 degrees. Once it does that, this entire area will start filling, and then we'll have our polluted water. Now, if worse comes to worse, we'll put a tepidizer in here, and that way the liquid stays liquid. But I kind of have an idea that I'd like to use, and that's to take all that nice, icy, cold, polluted water and cycle it through the electrolyzer setup. And that way it kind of does two things. Warms up the water before we sieve it, because we're going to have to sieve it because it's polluted water, and it'll also keep the entire electrolyzer cool. We have our first stone hatch incubating, so I wanted to take a moment and discuss hatch math. Now right now we're just taking all the hatching eggs and turning them into omelets. The hatching egg produces 1,000 grams of raw egg, and then that raw egg turns into 2,800 calories of omelet. This is not the ideal setup, because it's much better taking a hatch and turning it into barbecue because you get 4,000 calories instead of 2800 plus the barbecue is a quality of good plus three and the omelet is a standard plus two remember the plus two and plus three don't wait to the actual morale bonuses that they give i've done videos on hatch math so i don't want to reiterate it too much but i will go over some of the general details but long story short each hatch in its 100 cycle lifespan when you take into account that they only produce eggs when they're an adult hatch so you discount five of those cycles, so it's actually 95 cycles of egg-bearing life, and because at proper reproduction when they're happy and groomed, they lay an egg about once every 5.88 cycles, that's the 17% of reproduction change per cycle, it comes out to be that each hatch produces a little over 16 eggs in its lifespan. So then you take that 16 eggs, and you multiply it times the 4,000 calories. And that comes out to be 64,600 calories. Well, when you multiply that times 8 hatches in that stable, you get 516,800 calories. But then you divide that by 100 cycles, and you're given a little over 5,000 calories per cycle. That's why, for general hatch math, we just predict that each hatch farm will feed about five normal duplicates. Well, we don't have normal duplicates. Remember, we're playing on max difficulty, so that means our duplicates eat 
twice as much. For general math, I'm just going to assume it takes two stables to feed five dupes. And with six stables fully populated with happy critters, we'll be able to keep 15 dupes alive. Now that is not taking into account bottomless stomach. Now it's going to be a month of Sundays before we get all those hatch farmers up and really producing. Until then, we're just going to keep using bristleberries in the background as well. But as you can see, we're up at almost 400,000 calories. So I've been trimming back on some of these mealwoods. Because when using our refrigerators, we're not going to be able to get through 378,000 calories before some of this turns to rot. Now when we have our infinite food storage set up, then we can climb as high as we want. Now once we get all those hatches going, we'll get rid of the egg cracker and the omelet set up and we'll turn all those hatches into meat instead of eggs. Now when I sat down to record this episode, I had all intentions of doing oxygen setup and hatch ranching, and I recorded all the footage for it. And in editing, I realized I'm up over 20 minutes and I haven't even gotten to the oxygen setup. So we're going to cut it out here. The next episode will sort of be a continuation on this one, except it'll be centered around the oxygen setup. I hope you had a great time watching. I'll talk to you soon.